Oh my God. Episode 195. What am I going to do for 200? That's pretty big. 200's coming up. Five more weeks. Holy cow. This week, my friend Amy Clayton, who's been on here before and is a licensed psychotherapist, is here with my sister-in-law, Cotty, and we're talking about postpartum depression. I am so happy for this episode. I've been trying to do this episode for a while, and these two busy ladies and myself all have very busy schedules, and it's taken us a while to get our schedules to line up. And finally, they did. Yay! And I think we had a great conversation about postpartum, about the symptoms of, the differences between postpartum and baby blues and and uh, postpartum psychosis. Um, we talk about anxiety, generalized anxiety. We talk about going to therapy. We talk about getting medicated, some of the stigmas around being medicated, when when to seek treatment or call your doctor when you're when postpartum symptoms get to a certain point we talked about our experiences personally with postpartum with having babies with the trauma of having babies um and how hard it is because it's pretty freaking hard and your body just is ripped apart when you have a baby so Sometimes it's harder for, you know, to get it put back together. For some people, it's harder than others. So I hope you enjoy this uh, episode. If you are suffering or believe you're suffering from postpartum, you can go to postpartum.net for support groups, therapists, and more. If you're experiencing symptoms, you should ask your doctor to screen you. You can ask your general practitioner. You can ask your OB. You could probably ask your cardiologist. You could probably ask just about any medical doctor to screen you for postpartum depression or depression and anxiety in general. And uh, any time is the time. You could be seven months, uh, have a seven month old and still suffer from postpartum. It can just start then as well. It doesn't have to happen right after you have a baby. And postpartum is something that is temporary. So it's definitely worth getting help uh, if you feel you have symptoms of postpartum. I am so grateful to Amy and Cotty for coming on and talking about their experiences and for Amy sharing her experiences and knowledge about it. She specializes in postpartum as a, as a psychotherapist. And, uh, I value her, her opinion and her knowledge and her experience very much. And I really applaud Cotty for being brave enough to come and share her story also, because I think the point is no one is alone. Uh, Someone you know has had or is having symptoms of postpartum depression, and you're just not alone. So it's nice to have a conversation about something, and maybe maybe it'll inspire some of you to get some help or to get some education or to help someone else in your community or your family who may be suffering. So thank you for coming back every week. Thank you for all the well wishes for my brand new, ad, my one advertiser, Manscaped. They're not advertising on this episode, but thank you for all my well wishes because I got an advertiser. I'm so excited. Thank you for all your emails. Thank you for your suggestions for episode ideas. And uh, thanks for coming back every week. If you know anyone who needs to hear this discussion about postpartum depression, please share this podcast with them. And uh, I appreciate the support. So hope you enjoy this episode with Amy and Cotty about postpartum. I rode my bicycle past your window last night. I roller skated to your door at daylight. It almost seems like you're avoiding me. Well, the heat's coming on. I should have come out here earlier and checked on the heat. I'm so sorry. It's actually not bad. I, I'm now. totally fine. I'm the I'm worst menopausal, ever. so I'm great. Are you menopausal? Well, I'm perimenopausal. I'm perimenopausal for like 20 years. I have been for at least 15. Yeah. For sure. Isn't like the night sweats. Uh, do you have any of that yet? You don't. You're too young. How yeah. old are you? 39. 39. Oh, yeah. yeah you're way, way, too, too, way too, young. too young. Yeah. Well. Whatever. Bring it on. No more kids. 
Never have to worry um, about no, that. No, that's not, not what that means. Yeah, right. no. Never mind. Then I'm good. <laughs> I, wish, no. I wish it meant that. No, perimenopausal is like pre-menopause. Yeah. yeah. So it's like it's your body All the symptoms of menopause without the loss of the period. So it's really awesome. Oh, that's awful. So yes. you're still fertile. Yeah. Oh, that's awful. You're fertile myrtle. But I have massive night sweats, like to the point where I have to get up and change my clothes. Like mm-hmm. my whole shirt is complete. My hairline mm-hmm. is soaked. Mm-hmm. My pillow is wet. Um, just enough to make it annoying that you have to get up. Yeah. Well, yeah. I can't sleep through it because yeah. I'm freezing. Because once your body like slows down, you're wet. Right. Because you're like yeah. sleeping like in wet clothes. Which is so. ironic because you're not wet anywhere else. No, true. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm jinxed. <laughs> All right. I don't have that symptom. No, but, but it will. It, it, like it, people it, do. Yeah. People do. I don't get the nights. But everybody gets something different. That's yeah. another thing. It's like a grab bag effect. Right. Mm-hmm. Like you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> oh, it's not fun. No. And it's been going on forever. And my doctor was like, you know, anywhere between like 10 and two years. And I was like, mm-hmm. what? I, years. It's been it's been at least 10 years for me for the night sweats. It's been forever since we before we remodeled our house, oh my our gosh. other house. Yeah, that's how long I've been having night sweats. That's uh, awful. It is awful. And it. I think it disrupts your sleep. Yeah. Oh, it I does. Think yeah, The hormone yeah. cycle, <laughs> all the, say. not if just you have the sweating. To get up, even if you go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, it disrupts your sleep. Oh, well, yeah. Well, yeah. But I mean, like, I, I feel like I go through these sleep cycles where sometimes I am the, I'm just dead. Like yeah. as soon as I hit the pillow, I sleep all night. And then I'll go through these pockets where I am not really fully asleep at yeah. all, all night yeah. long. Yeah, you're like an alpha. And I'm not worried. I'm not like running lists. I mean, I have those nights too, but yeah. sometimes I'm like, can I just go to sleep? Right, it's just blank yeah. up there. Yeah. yeah, and I don't know why. I think it's hormonal. Yeah. Speaking yeah, of hormonal, hormonal, right? Yes. Yes. Speaking of hormonal, <laughs> let's go right into that. We've been trying, I've been trying to get this podcast forever because yeah. I think it's really important to talk about postpartum depression mm-hmm. because it is such a real thing that nobody talks about, yeah. but why don't it, why doesn't anybody talk about it? I, I think there's shame in it. I think there's shame that there's not that like instant maternal connection with your baby and you're supposed to be perfect and you know, it's you're supposed to know exactly what to do. And I remember the few celebrities that would come out about it were instantly overshadowed by something else. Really? Like I remember when Brooke Shields came out about something like Tom Cruise spoke against it. But <laughs> I mean, I have to go back and look for sure, but it was I was like, why is this not getting the attention it deserves? Mm. And she wrote a whole book on it, it was amazing. Mm. But it, it kind of just gets quashed again, you know. Mm-hmm. It goes right back under, and it, it, it's a it's a serious issue with physicians too. How so? So I had it with mm-hmm. my first one, mm-hmm. and I went to my OB, and I am a licensed practitioner of mental health, and I said I have postpartum, mm-hmm. and she looked at me and she said, "Oh, you're fine. You got a healthy, happy door prize. Go home." What? Oh yeah. She was like, "You're overreacting," and I'm like. Mm, I'm doing my own mental status check. <laughs> like, um, I literally dreamt of leaving the baby on the neighbor's doorstep last night. Like, I'm no, I'm not fine. You know, like I don't want to get on my chair. I don't want to explore other rooms of the house. I'm freaking. I'm holding her breastfeeding, thinking about how she's going to get in an accident when she's 16. And I can't handle this when she starts driving. Like, this is this is not normal activity, right? right. So I went back to her again, and I was like, I have postpartum. And she was like, well, then maybe you should see somebody. <laughs> what? And she's a prominent doctor in Beverly Hills. So I'm, I won't name names, but I was like, okay. So I called some colleagues and spoke to them and, and got treatment. And I, for me, it was therapy. I didn't need medication. And I was breastfeeding. And, um, you know, there's certain classifications of medications you can't take anyway. And I was very serious about not taking anything during delivery even i didn't want any pain medication nothing so you crazy i uh, crazy because i got a c-section too oh um, what? yeah no, I, <laughs> they can do that they did an epidural but then i was oh, straight okay. ibuprofen oh, after okay that. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, I no, no. like, <laughs> what? No, but at best, I don't no. even think that's legal. <laughs> right? No, Is but like they a did. Magi- magician with a box and a saw? It they- was it was bad news. I mean, it, part of my postpartum came from, they overdosed me on the epidural. It was a really crazy story. They had a code blue next door while I was oh. in the hospital. And so they had me under and then they looked, and I worked at Cedars. So they they knew me there and they were like, we're ha- somebody's crashing in the room next door, which means a, a mom delivering is losing. Oh my God. Right. So I was like, just go, 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 go. And I was strapped to the table. They're like, are you okay? I'm like, yes, go. So they all, the whole team went and some up and coming 
young anesthesiologist came in and was like, oh, they prepped you, but they left. And I was like, yeah, there's a code next door. And she's like, well, I'm just going to give you the epidural. I'm like, they already gave me the dose. Oh. And she's like, well, it doesn't say here that they gave it to you. I'm like, they didn't have time to chart it. And she's like, I don't think they gave it to you. And she dosed (gasps) me again. And I started going down. (laughs) So then they ran back into my room. Oh, my God. It was gnarly. You were like, curd brew. (laughs) (laughs) Curd brew over here. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So it, it was. It was gnarly. They had me, so they, they got her out and she was okay. But then they rushed me to post-op and I was like on oxygen and they kept slapping my face, telling me to breathe. I'm like, I don't know if I was speaking or not, but I'm like, I am breathing. <laughs> like, I don't know what else to tell you. Like, I feel like I'm breathing. <laughs> it, it was gnarly. So then the second child, they had all the records and I hadn't, you know, sued or anything. So, but they, you know, they were like, holy crap, you know, yeah, be careful. Yeah. So they underdosed me. So I felt it when they cut. Oh, my God. <laughs> Amy. Have another. I, I know. Well, so I didn't want to have another. She actually turned and I thought I was going to have a V-back, but it didn't happen. Oh. So they were cutting. They, oh, first of all, the suction didn't work. Oh. Then they cut into me. And I was like, um, I now know what it feels like to be stabbed in a dark alley. Wow. Thanks a lot. And the, and the doctor was cracking up. I'm like, no, really? He's like, you can feel that? I'm like, yeah. He's like, everybody stop. They like put a little bit more. I was like, okay, I'm good now. I think you can continue. How it awful. Was gnarly. Oh, so two and trigger. through. Uh, like, is that your trigger? Know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, being cut and feeling no, it? No, just to your whole experience. Oh. <laughs> pretty much like it's confirmed. I'm never having another kid <laughs> at Cedars. <laughs> Not at Cedars. Just under it at Cedars. Yeah. No, I mean, it was luck of the draw. And uh, honestly, like. It was I luck know. of the draw, but I had a similar problem at Cedars. Did you? With my epidural. <laughs> my first epidural, they, uh, it was a spinal. And I was paralyzed Wait, immediately. Did, did you only want an epidural and that you got a spinal? I wanted an epidural. And, and, it, and it, he put it in my spine and went, uh-oh. Yeah, so. And I went, uh-oh. Who says, uh-oh? And my legs went, floom. Yeah. They just compl- completely collapsed. Yeah. And he was like, I'll be right back. Yeah. Ooh, it was Jesus. bad. And I threw up from the time mm-hmm. I had it. I mm-hmm. threw up and I had that terrible headache afterwards. Yep. I threw up every, I pushed for three and a half hours. And I threw up every time I would push, I would vomit. Yep. So they kept giving me popsicles. And I'd push and vomit. And throw up. Push yeah. and vomit. And it was from the epidural. Because the second time with Isla. No problem. It was nothing. The difference between a spinal and epidural is like. Is a it, hair. It, yeah, it is. It is a hair. That's what they how tell the me. They do that. They tell me was what she said was afterwards. She said, you must have a very thin epidermis around oh, your spinal your column. Yeah. <laughs> so next time you come in, tell us, that. let them know and they won't go so deep. How about just let them know they screwed up last time? Right. Well, I did that. Like the next time I came in, I was like, listen, this happened last time. And I got the head of anesthesiology. Oh, yeah. She see- came in and was like, doop. And I was like, oh, this is what it's supposed to be. I can do this all day long. It was no, it was so awful with Georgia. Oh. And then I couldn't when when you for me, when I had the spinal and the drug wore off. I had full pain, full feeling immediately. It was like, boom. I went from completely mm-hmm. paralyzed to full pain. Yeah. And then they dosed me again, and I'd go right back to paralyzed and immediately start throwing up again. Why were they giving you spinals? They weren't. It was an accident. So a epidural well, it's, it's, is it's the a, first layer, and if they push oh, it a okay. bit more, it's instant. So epidural just means it's a slower progression. I got an epidural just, for my first, right. and mm-hmm. then spinal for your second, which is common if you've had a C-section. Because an epidural has a shelf life. Right. And a so, spinal, you'll have more time in case there's scarring and mm. they need to keep you open longer. Right. Mm. So spinal is instant paralysis. So that yeah, they that can was like, go to yeah. work immediately. Yeah. It's like they use it for emergency C-sections. Oh, so it was an, uh, oh, okay. It was and then accident. an epidural. <laughs> or, I was an accident, yeah. which caused my brain fluid to leak, which caused me to have this, uh, this, I don't know if you remember this, but you yeah, remember my remember. Aunt Diane stayed for so long? It's because I couldn't sit upright for like 10 days. Yeah. And I was on Vicodin. She gave me my last pill and she went, okay, here's what's going to happen. <laughs> You're going to be really angry for about two days. It's okay. <laughs> and she knew this off because? Vicodin. Because she was, she was a labor and delivery nurse. Oh, she was head awesome. nurse of labor and oh delivery God, in Georgia. So- she came to help me with delivery and went, yeah, I'll be staying for several yeah. days so after. Lucky. So she would bring me the baby and then she'd go, okay, go back to sleep. And she'd take her out and everybody else was out with Georgia. And I just wasn't up and running for like 10 days. Yeah. It was a long time. And thank God for her. She literally gave me that last pill and went, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be so angry for two days. You're yeah. just withdrawing from this pill. Just take a deep breath. It's okay. I love her. You're going to be fine. I know her and I love her. She's amazing. <laughs> she for, That was her passion. 
Yeah. And she was really good at it. I just she was just a great nurse. Um, she passed away. She was great. And I miss I miss her a lot. But she got me through that for sure. And you know, I think why don't doctors say that to the their patients about Vicodin specifically? Because she was right. I was fucking mad. Yeah. For two days, I was like, I was grinding but if my you teeth. Knew that that was going to happen. You'd anticipate it, and you knew that it had a shelf life, like the epidural. Like you'd be waiting for that. And you know, I think there's a lot of things I wish the medical profession would do, which is give a little, like, buy me a drink first, right? And give me a little more information. Like, right. I, I know it makes sense to them, and it it's just common sense if you're in the medical profession. But, you know, when I had the C-section, I didn't realize how many nerve endings would be cut mm. and that I didn't feel anything or mm-hmm. that I wouldn't be able to sit up on my own for several days. Mm. So, you know, no one told you that. Inc- no, nobody said anything about that. Did anybody tell you any of that? Yeah, a lot's changed. Yeah. Has a yeah. lot. A good. lot has She's changed. She's got a four and a one, a one year, old. year old. Okay. And let me tell you something you don't go to a pediatrician appointment without filling out a mental health form every oh, really? single well, time. That's, that's good. good because I went back yep. to my OB two years after I had my first and said, I'm going to educate your staff on postpartum. Every time you're there. Yeah. Your OB, I was so the pediatrician's angry. office, and it's a postpartum. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, I that's a, good. Yeah. It's, yeah. They are really aggressive about it now. I hope that's broad. Not just Yeah, but it's your... also a form. So you're like, am I really going to circle one? You know what I mean? <laughs> well, <laughs> be like, as I'm holding a baby. <laughs> but you. But no, I mean, I, I was never a one, but yeah. But I was like, huh. you know, I think everyone circles like, are you anxious about you know, ridiculous things right. in the middle. Yeah, of course. Right. What but, is um, on the form? I know. I've never had that form. Um, it's, yeah, I don't know it's, it's, it's very, it's like 10 questions and it'll be like on a scale of one to five. And it's like, uh, have you cried every day for the past five days? Um, are you having suicidal thoughts? I believe these were the questions. Um, so is it like a Beck depression inventory or is it like specific to postpartum? It's specific to postpartum. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, are you connecting with your baby? You know, I, I remember walking around and seeing some of my friends who were just like holding the baby like this, you know, no problem slinging them around. And I was like, how are you doing that? Yeah. And then, and then like, I'd see somebody I hadn't seen in a while and they had a newborn around the same age and they were just totally at ease. And I'd be like, but you weren't a C-section, right? And they're like, but yeah, I was. Yeah. I'm like, doesn't that make you feel really bad about yourself? Uh huh. <laughs> did it make you feel bad about yourself when you no. were, uh, oh, I, I did. Oh, when you saw people doing it with such ease? Oh, I thought you meant about having a C section. I was like, no. no. Oh, no, no, no. I was no, like, no. yeah, I'm good. I was actually pissed about that too, though. I wanted to have natural delivery. Oh, I well, It really natural messes with your hormones, they say. Yeah. It's oh, does like, it? Yeah, because when you do natural uh, delivery, oh, yeah, yeah. there's something that happens hormonally in your body, whereas that is like just pulling a baby out of the sunroof, being right. like, all right, it's out here. Of the sunroof. <laughs> you know? Like, it's just like, you're done. <laughs> yeah. And it, it doesn't, oh, though. Yeah, I guess labor <laughs> processes your hormones. It does yeah. something. Yeah, your body yeah. goes through the natural process. Exactly. I think it's when the, I remember this now that you mention it, I think it's when the baby passes through the birth canal, it yep. triggers yes. like a bunch of hormone release. Yeah. Once it, but it has to pass through the, the canal. Yeah, not through the sunroof. And they not can't put the it sunroof. back up again. No. No. What is it? Maybe they should put a mop in there and just, and then you go, okay, something passed through here. Let's yeah. well, trigger. I remember working on the eighth floor and all these women would come in for these TVSs. What's a TVS? Transvaginal sling. What's and that? It's like, it's a repair of the muscles that happen to stretch out when you have children. Uh huh. So I was like, I don't have to have one of those because no. nobody came out that way. A transvaginal sling. Mm-hmm. One of my friends is like, I can never ride a bike again. I was like, how often are you really riding a bike? <laughs> like, really? Why can they I not ride a bike? Because they pee might... everywhere. Yeah. <clears throat> oh. I was like, well, don't ride bikes. Is that, is that <laughs> I mean, right? It's a pretty easy solution. Well, I haven't ridden a right. bike in years, so. <laughs> have, have your kids done this yet? It hurts when I do this. So stop doing that, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> I've well, got a four-year-old Bert, so yes. Oh, yes. Oh, oh no. Yeah, her son is my <laughs> husband. Oh, Leanne too. looks at him almost every time and goes, how did I not have this child? Like, I, this is yeah. this is That's my so DNA funny. right here. This is my husband. That is Bert Kreischer mm-hmm. in in a four-year-old. It's, it's really amazing, actually. It's crazy. Because, you know, I've said this before about my own kids. What's interesting about having kids with someone like Bert is that I, Bert is so quirky 
and he has so many uh, distinctions <laughs> that you think he's doing them on purpose, right? Until you have a child who starts doing some of those distinctions and you go, oh, oh that's not on purpose. Yeah. She definitely, he's never here. Right, right. So she, she didn't, didn't learn that from Learn him, yeah. that from him. Yeah. That's wiring. So yes. then I had to adjust the way I processed Bert. Yeah. Because then I had to forgive him. There had for, to be more empathy there. <laughs> I did because yeah. there was a lot of stuff where I'd go, there's no way you don't know that you're doing that. Yeah. And then I'd have a two-year-old doing it and I'd go, oh, there's no way he knows that he's doing uh-huh. that. I mean, there's no way. And then, but I didn't have her son. I had nice little tiny shades of Bert in my kids. He is actually burnt oh, no. like, like concentration he is it's like if you cut off like bird's arm and then grew it into a yeah. person it's kind of like, like that he's like a mini group he's like a mini group <laughs> he is and i watched teddy going wow i have to have even more empathy yeah. for Bert now because even more of what i thought you were doing on purpose it's is really not, not happening this purpose. is not on purpose yeah. this is exactly how you're wired and it's hard too sometimes because a lot of it with bert is about boundaries mm-hmm. about holding a boundary he he can't do it he just can't do it he can't do it and to see it in a four-year-old is so similar mm-hmm. it's exactly the same mm-hmm. so and you more go, age appropriate and more age appropriate <laughs> but somehow he never yeah got whatever it was that he needed to figure out how to just hold it like with himself not yeah. even with other people yeah. per se just like i will only eat two pieces of pizza he right. can't do it no it's, no, it's not possible no. right or i will not say the following <laughs> exactly or or i will not buy another hat at lids because i have eight thousand hats already from lids <laughs> it's the same thing and then teddy will if you give him a bowl of lollipops it's oh. over Right, he'll open one taste, open oh, one yeah. taste, oh, open yeah. one oh, taste. My gosh. So impulsive. And when you say, "Hey, you need to do a photo shoot you with know, the two of them," two's enough. He's like, "My brain is bleeding," <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh my god, Bert! Bert says the same thing to me. You can't talk to me like that. You're saying who I am is a wrong person." And I'm like, "I'm saying maybe four lollipops is not the best right, plan. Right? That's yeah. all I'm. I mean, don't read into it." That's it's all I'm so saying. So much passion. Yeah. It's so much passion. I oh think Teddy God. does something similar to Bert too, where I will say to Bert, hey, maybe two lollipops is enough. And Bert will hear me say, you're a disgusting uh-huh. piece of shit and you are a terrible human being. <clears throat> and I cannot believe you would ever do something as egregious as take a third lollipop. Right. That's what he's heard right, me right. say. That's how he reacts to it. It's But yeah. no, he'll repeat back to me <laughs> what... I said, and it's not at all what I said, not, I mean, I'll go, no, actually exactly what I said was, are you sure you want that third lollipop? Word for word. Right. But what he thinks I meant was this. Right. He puts his own meaning into it. That's, he ascribes his own little special meaning. He does. And then swears that I said that. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm going to start pulling up the Nest Cam and showing you what I said, because I'm not going to be held accountable for the you said I'm a horrible person when what I said was, are you sure you want to do that third Mm. lollipop? And Teddy's reaction is with the finger. You are so rude. (laughs) No, he does not. You are so rude. Your words make me so sad. Please tell me you have that on video. Oh, I, yeah. Are you kidding? (laughs) Are you kidding me? That's genius. Yeah. Yeah. It's everyone's very rude. You are so So rude. Your words make me so sad. so amazing. Why are you so mean? (laughs) It's like, oh my God, how did this turn around on me? Oh, I, I told the him. mean lady taking it with love. I was like, you're going to, your, your tummy's going to hurt. He's like, you don't know that. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. I was like, fine, eat it all. And I know that's not the right answer, but I'm like, learn it on your own well, terms. Some, no, sometimes it's experiential. <laughs> right? yeah. Sometimes they have to try that. I'm, my kids had a, a play date with a friend and the mom is overly permissive and they went to soup plantation. Mm. Oh. And I will frequently say, <laughs> this was years ago, and okay. I will frequently say to them, you know, so make sure you're having protein, throw yeah. in some vegetable, and then if you want some carbohydrates, go crazy. But like first you put the fuel in mm-hmm. and then if there's room for the extra stuff, fine. Like mm-hmm. I'm not like, oh, be careful. You yeah, know. yeah. But f- fuel first, right? You don't put sugar in a gas tank. Like yeah. start off with good gasoline and then you can, <laughs> you know, put additives in later. So they did not have anybody saying that to them. She returned both of them to me like this. Uh. <laughs> it was like... What did you do? And she's like, I just let them have whatever they wanted. And I was like, genius. Right. Now, her child's this 
this small and has the metabolism of a freaking rabbit. Yeah. And she's dying to put food in it. And she has no clue that my kids were just normal people. Yeah. And so they came home and both of them were like, it, one of them was on the toilet and the other one was throwing up. Oh and my like, God. So, <laughs> so I said, I don't think I need to say anything to you about this experience, except that maybe limiting yourself sometimes is good. And they were like, we got it. I got it. Wait, I know exactly what they ate too. Cause I had to stop the going pudding. to soup. <laughs> I had to stop going to soup plantation right. because I was like sitting in a booth and I get buffet anxiety. It mm. sounds crazy, but no, I, it's not. It's I too much. Hate, it's too much. No, it's not or, even too many choices. What is it? It's that it's everyone's going to eat the things mm. I want to oh. eat. Oh, that's Bert has it. Oh, it drives. It makes me so anxious. I hate like, like, and I work in TV. So like, it's like craft services. Oh. It makes me shake. You got to like, run. Get that ah. thing first. Yeah. And soup, soup plantation. I had to stop going because I was like <laughs> staring They'd have all the salads and the soups. And it's like, gross, who touches any of that? Right. And then at the end, they've got the pizza buffet uh -huh. and the pudding. Uh -huh. And I was like laser focused. I'm like, the pigs are all eating the pizza. It's all gone. <laughs> I was like, I couldn't handle. I Bert like, has that stuff. same anxiety. That is really It's funny. awful. It's, it's so it's, stupid, too. It, it's a real panic, though. Okay. Like, he, he looks like a, a cornered animal at a buffet. <laughs> He literally in his yeah. eyes, he's yeah. like like this. It's darting. He's like darting. Going, he is. He took three tenders. There's only twelve and, uh, in there. He watches oh, everybody. God. Like it's never like they're not gonna reload it's, everything. <laughs> it's scarcity. It's that's what it is. Worried about the scarcity of the of the available food source. He is it's I very guess. primal. We oh, were at my I, grandmother's yeah. house for Easter right. one year and Isla was a baby, like hold hold her still baby. Mm -hmm. So she's probably like nine months old or something, eight months old. And he's watching the line at the buffet. And at one point he goes, you're on your own. Oh and my just God. leaves me with both kids and gets in line and takes. And he was like, oh, they were definitely going to run out of your grandmother's dressing. There's no way I'm coming all the way from California not having some oh dressing. I didn't get any because he didn't yeah. make a plate for me. I'm sitting there with two kids. I, George is probably three. You're just a nursing mom, so who cares? Uh, you're on your own. I he literally know. said, you're on your own. I was like, it's my grandmother's. You're, you're like, guess what? That's that's literally the tagline for my life right now. <laughs> you're, on <your> own. <laughs> you're on your own. It's so true. Right? Okay, so oh postpartum. God. I printed out these things from the Mayo Clinic. Yes. About the difference between the baby blues. Oh, yeah. Postpartum. And, well, why don't you tell so, me what... And then the, the third one was... Postpartum psychosis. Yes. So about... First of all, most people think postpartum is postpartum psychosis, which is so wrong. Mm. So... Baby blues happen, they say, and it changes every year, but most roughly it's between 70 and 80% of all women. So that means in the first few weeks after delivery um, or in the perinatal stage, which is around birth, mm -hmm. you get this like anxiety, concern, mild depression. You can get some restlessness, some agitation. You know, it's, it's super common. You, your hormones basically like, triple and then they evacuate your system and it's just Mr. Toad's wild ride in there. Right. Right. <clears throat> so baby blue is normal. Then there's postpartum depression and that's about one in a hundred women will get that. Oh no, I'm sorry. One in 10 women will get that. Right. Then postpartum psychosis is one in a thousand. Wow. So that's how rare it is. And that's what you see on the news of like mm -hmm. woman in Texas took her kids to a lake and drowned them yeah. one by one. And people freak out about that and they miss the middle. It's like uh. they'll acknowledge the baby blues and they'll say, well, you don't have postpartum psychosis, but they don't touch the middle area. And what right? is the middle? That's postpartum depression. No, but what is that? Oh, God. It's baby blues. Ex it could be baby blues extended. Uh-huh. It could be more severe than that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I had patients who had massive anxiety, like they've never had in their life, mm -hmm. could not sleep, like couldn't sleep because they were waiting for the kid to cry, couldn't sleep because they, you know, wanted to sleep at the same time as the baby, but they were worried about the baby sleeping too soundly and not waking up. I mean, it, there was no thing that could make them feel better. Mm -hmm. And then there's this whole terrible choice you have to make with, if you need a class medication that you can't breastfeed with, you have to stop breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes me less of a mother. Right. right. So there's all these, you know, instances where you're faced with, is, this is best for me, but it's not best for my baby. Mm -hmm. Or this is best for my baby, but it's not best for me. And mm -hmm. there's such a balance. And dads can get depressed too. Mm -hmm. So it's, that is the biggest chunk. I, I, well, most people get the baby blues 
the the biggest undiagnosed category would be postpartum depression. Right. Which is directly following, which is when I told my AOB and they were like, oh, you're fine. It'll clear up. Well, I'm going to read what this Mayo Clinic says. So baby blues are mood swings, anxiety, sadness, irritability, feeling overwhelmed, crying, reduced concentration, appetite problems, trouble sleeping. Mm-hmm. Um and that's pretty much me every day. <laughs> so do I still have baby blues? Yeah. No, well, not really. Well, technically, you're still postpartum, right? It's after delivery, I am. yes. Okay, so par- postpartum depression mm-hmm. is depressed mood or severe mood swings, excessive crying, mm-hmm. difficulty bonding with your baby, withdrawing from your family and friends, loss of appetite, or eating much more than usual, mm-hmm. inability to sleep or sleeping too much, overwhelming fatigue or loss of energy, Reduced interest in pleasure and activities you used to enjoy. Intense irritability and anger. Fear that you're not a good mother. Hopelessness. Feelings of worthlessness, shame, guilt, or inadequacy. Diminished ability to think clearly, concentrate, or make decisions. Restlessness. Severe anxiety and panic attacks. Mm -hmm. Thoughts of harming yourself or your baby. Recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. Um, I would make an amendment, two amendments to that. Okay. One is... You do not need to feel like you're not bonded with your baby to have postpartum depression. That's a misnomer. Everybody thinks like, well, mm. I'm connected with the baby. I must not be depressed. Mm. Not true. Okay. You can have bonded feelings with the baby and they're overly bonded, which causes anxiety mm-hmm. through that stage. Um, another thing um, is that, I, they, I don't know if they mentioned this, that you don't have to have postpartum psycho- or postpartum depression right after baby blues, you can be okay for a few weeks, few months Mm -hmm. and get it at seven months Mm post-delivery. Is that, you're Mm -hmm. shaking your head? Yes. Yeah. And a lot of people, and then you're thinking, but I was okay. Yeah. There was no connection. I go, I stopped breastfeeding three months ago. Right. And you Google it and it's like, as soon as you stop breastfeeding, this could kick in. And and I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. How did you figure out you had it? Uh, there was no denying it. Well, but did I was did having you get panic it diagnosed attacks as well, or were they like, "Oh, that's yeah"? The same well, I was having anxiety when I was pregnant, halfway mm-hmm. through my pregnancy, and I kept calling my OB, and I was having panic attacks. Mm-hmm. Where my I was wearing my Apple Watch, my heart rate was like one forty eight. Oh yeah, and I was like, "This is crazy." So then I'd call my OB, and then finally, my OB said to me, I, "He talked to me constantly," and then he goes, "You need to see someone." You need to see a cardiologist mm-hmm. and you need to see. Good for him. I'm um, glad. He was great. He you're is supposed, great. You're supposed to always rule out medical issues. He's like, they've missed see something. a cardiologist and then see. He gave me a referral for um, a psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he was like, I need to make sure it's not your heart first mm-hmm. and then figure out if this is something going on with you mentally. Right. So a uh, cardiologist put an EKG on me for the weekend was like, you're totally fine. Right. I see. It was Bert's cardiologist. Mm-hmm. He's like pregnant women. First kid, come in here constantly, increase the blood flow, blah, blah, blah. Well, but panic attacks mimic heart issues. Exactly. And most people don't realize that. So he's like, you don't have a heart issue. Right. Then I talked to the psychiatrist and she's like, "Um, you know, I could put you on a small dose of Zoloft. Mm -hmm. And I went to San Francisco with Bert that weekend. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to him at breakfast and Bert's like, you're not going on Zoloft. Mm -hmm. I was like, why? He's like, you're pregnant. I was like, okay. And then I decided not to. Oh, um, and I was fine. And then I had Teddy. Everything was great. And I remember watching videos going, God, I was so good for the first like three or four months. Mm-hmm. And then it was July. It started happening in July where I was scared to drive. And mm-hmm. he was born in October. Um, yeah. And I was scared to go places mm-hmm. and then going to work became really hard. Mm-hmm. And then everyone started checking in on me and my family. And that made me feel crazy. Right. Why um, checking up on me? made me feel nuts. Yeah. So then I went on Lexpro, Mm -hmm. um, went to the same doctor, went back to her and it all kind of went back, you know, but I was having massive, massive panic attacks and it was, did you go to the ER at all or no? No, no. I had Xanax and I would take Xanax when needed. Okay. Um, I also have really bad health anxiety, so I'm terrified to take, like when I got home with both kids, I didn't take any painkillers. Um, I was ibuprofen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, which they don't tell you, by the way, I was popping that like crazy because my incision went open and everything. And I had to go back. Amy, you are just the the champion of of the horrible, right? So, uh, I was taking 600 to 800 milligrams of Motrin because I couldn't take pain medication and it's not great for your liver. So my lactation consultant's like, you need to stop doing that. I was doing the same thing. Okay. Yeah. You just like white knuckling it. I was afraid I wouldn't wake up in the middle of the night. Right. Um, yeah. So there was no denying it with Teddy. 
where it just hit me like a brick wall. Literally, my vision went out at lunch one day and it like triggered my brain went, you're not okay. And that just triggered something in me. A wallpaper at lunch just started moving. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm losing my mind. Right. And then it almost like accelerated it that I was like something was wrong. Well, you were and I dug into, into it. That. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was like, OK, she got the message. Thanks. I was like, ah. Yeah. So but I went on Lexpro so, and I went on it for about six months, I think. Mm-hmm. And then I went off and I was totally fine. Yeah. And then you're terrified with your second. You're like, it's going to happen. You know, you're waiting yeah. for it to happen. Mm. Uh, it's interesting you say that. How did you feel after you had your second? Fine. Fine. But I also did cognitive behavioral therapy in between. Right. So the panic attacks became so manageable right. because I knew what it was were. just a feeling. It was no different than feeling extreme excitement or right. sadness. Right. So it was like it, it took the power away from it, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Well, plus you were talking about it. So it wasn't hidden and inside mm-hmm. and like a secret that you I did had, but... CBT for like four months. Yeah, I love CBT. Every day, every yeah. week. And I started with like twice a week. And the first thing he said to me, he's like, if you take Xanax, don't bother showing up. Right. Because wow. It, well, because it numbs you and then you're not going to mm-hmm. do the work. He's like, every do, time right? you take a Xanax to cope with your panic or your anxiety, mm-hmm. the next time it creeps up on you, it's going to be 10 times worse. And mm-hmm. that's what it does. It just escalates. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. It puts it in a little bank account, right? Mm-hmm. And once you go to cash it in, it just goes, and here's all of it. Right. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so then with the second child, would you say, did you have postpartum with Lola? I don't know. I don't really know. Because it, do, it doesn't muted. present itself for me like depression. Hmm. You it's know, anxiety. and anxiety, I have generalized yeah. anxiety. So it's right. like. Uh oh, it's a so Which, by bitch. The way, I've got a scratch. It's the worst anxiety it's ever. Awful. And, and, uh, no, I just I want I just to say, make you feel good, Gotti. I, I feel yes. no, I feel for you, and I, and I, I would like people to understand this because yes. I have teenagers that I see that have generalized anxiety disorder, and the parents are like, "So what causes it?" And I'm like, okay. "Everything and nothing." Yeah, and they're like, "Well, it must be something." I'm like, "Please don't ask your child that. Please don't sit and target your child and ask like, well, is it this? Is it this? Is it this?'" I'm like, "You are going to literally make them anxious in that." moment Mm -hmm. it can be sitting in a full row in a play and not being able to get out it can be going to a party because there are too many people Mm -hmm. it can be being at home and your parents aren't there and you don't know where they are i mean it can be anything and it's so crippling sometimes if you don't deal with it Mm -hmm. so plug for if you feel anxious (laughs) in many different situations you are not crazy right (laughs) see somebody it is a very real diagnosis. And, and it's very it's, treatable. It's very treatable. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's but very it's manageable. very frustrating, kind mm-hmm. of like, you know, the ADD stuff, right? Where you're experiencing it and, you know, it, nobody understands it from the outside. Mm-hmm. Right. So, yeah, I, uh, yeah, it's yeah. not easy. No, yeah. it's not. So, but at least you got the CBT4, which is amazing. It, it's a game changer. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I'm surrounded by a lot of people with anxiety and I keep telling them, I'm like, you have to do the work. Like you have to. Yeah. Please and talk to your niece, Isla, about it, please. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't, take, doesn't long. take long to do it. That's I'm back in it. I started again yeah. because of COVID. Um, I'm just nutty. You know, not That's awful to say, but you know what I mean? COVID has, again, it's, it's that itch. I'm just, you know, waiting to scratch and I find stuff. Right. You know? It's well, like- I, I will say this about being nutty, being mm-hmm. married to someone who's nutty and having at least one, maybe two nutty children. <laughs> Nutty makes for a very rich person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It makes for someone who thinks outside the box, who's a creative problem solver, who anticipates problems where other people would not. Yep, yep. I think it yeah, makes you got that right. a great person. <laughs> looking ready always. to pounce. It is much more <laughs> dynamic and yeah. interesting person in some ways. So it also makes for a person with grit who's had struggles, who's had to yes. get through them and doesn't have everything handed to them. I keep saying to Isla, it's your superpower. Yeah. You just have to figure out how yeah. to harness it. I'm, yeah. You know, it's like having Wonder Woman with her like, lasso and she doesn't know how to spin it right it's not right. it doesn't do you much good if you don't soon. have to spin it yeah. once you spin it you can lasso freaking a jet you see wonder yeah. woman she lassoed the invisible jet mm-hmm. right <laughs> I, mean, I know you can't see the jet but i swear she did she's it. got it but i think if you have generalized anxiety um and then dealing with postpartum there's a part of you that goes i should just be like gracious right now that like i have two healthy kids yep. you know that the, my, that my usual triggers aren't just scratching and knocking at the door so then I kind of like put my stuff on a shelf and go, let's focus on what re- what's really important. And I right. think a lot of moms do that. Uh-huh. They go, yeah. 
I should be happy that mm-hmm. I have two healthy kids because I follow I follow this woman on Instagram who both her children have a rare disease mm-hmm. and she's in the hospital twice a week with both of them. And I go, she is a warrior. Yeah. Like the fact that she even blow dries her hair every day. Right. right. I'm like, it's insane. I have two totally functioning children. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Help at home. Like I, I've got it all. Yeah. I don't even shower. Right. Like, you know, and I look at her and I'm like, she is amazing. Like, thank God she has those kids have her as right, a mom. Right, you know? right. Yeah. But I'm glad you bring that up because I think guilt is a part of, mm-hmm. of motherhood that I would love for us all to just uproot and remove. Because I felt yeah. guilty too, just like you, for having my own feelings. It was my therapist finally at one point said to me, emotional maturity is being able to hold two feelings at the same time. <laughs> so for you to be like, I actually hate my three-year-old. And obviously I love, love. and I'm so happy that I have her and that she's healthy yeah. and I'm grateful. Right. But right now I fucking hate you. Right. Like there's two things going on at one time. Right. And I think that we grow up somehow thinking it's only one. Like I hate you. And then that causes you to go, I'm a, I'm a horrible person, person yeah. and I suck at everything right. and I don't even deserve this child. And I think people get in those cycles and it makes them angry sometimes or resentful mm-hmm. when they can't see both sides of the coin. And Guilt should never be part of taking care of yourself. And I am guilty of not taking care of myself yeah. because I feel guilty. Like yesterday, About. Isla called me. She has having tummy trouble. We went to Sandy's the night before and Sandy is Chinese and Sandy had Chinese food from Monterey Park. And the three white people who were there, the super white people with our super white stomachs uh-huh. woke up with some terrible stomach trouble oh the next God. day because we eat. We eat whatever they serve. It's right. her birthday. Yeah. It's her birthday. So, of course, we eat what they serve. I wake up, stomach problems. Georgia, stomach problems. Isla, stomach problems. But Georgia and I are like, we're good. Isla calls me and goes, I can't do it. You got to come get me. And I know what she's going through. This is legit. So, of course, I was like, well, I have this appointment with my trainer. I don't ever put off my trainer, but I'm going to have to go get her now. But I had a moment where I actually had to think, uh, don't feel guilty you know, for saying no, if you can't come right. No, this is what it was. I was in a conference call Mm -hmm. and I couldn't just leave. And I was feeling very guilty about not being able to leave. Right. So I was like, text, she was in the bathroom, text me. And I said, listen, I'm in the middle of a call. I can't leave right this minute. And I'll be there as soon as I can. And she went, sounds good. And I went, well, why can't I just do that? Right. And not feel guilty that she's sitting there an extra 15, 20 minutes for me to finish. Especially when she said, Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. And, but my guilt is, oh, I should go right now. I right. should just stop this meeting. Yeah. She's having She's diarrhea in the bathroom. for me. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, anyway. Well, it's, it's interesting you brought guilt up, and that's why I asked how you were with your second. With my second, I was so cognizant, and I had also done the work in between, and I was like, I'm ready for anything. And also everything's easier the second time around, right? I mean, that that loves depending. commercial or huggies commercial. Well, depending. Physically, <laughs> yes, depending. Depending. But you know what? To, you have more information and knowledge yes, on that's how true. to do things, yes. right? So you're a bit my more first thing, secure. Yes. My first one, I'm like washing her in like a little tub that adjusts into the sink. And the second <laughs> one, I'm like, throw me the kids. And I'm like holding one in the shower and I pass it off to Wade and I hold the other one and I pass her off, you know? Yeah. So that was so much easier for me that I was looking down at her all the time going, oh my God, I love you. I'm so happy to have you. And then I'm looking at the other one going, I'm so sorry. You've got the other version of me. <laughs> like, so I had that guilt. I had the guilt of not being mm-hmm. it's like completely burdened with postpartum on the second time around. Mm, I, I'm like, I, that's interesting. Yeah. There's a book that uh, we just read a novel in this podcast called The Push. Mm-hmm. And it is partly about that where uh, the woman did not connect with her first child. It is clear she had postpartum. This yeah. is only a portion of the story, but she clearly had postpartum, had no connection with this child and had the second baby and was like in love. Right. And had those feelings <laughs> of like, I did not connect with you, but I connect with this one and I'm sorry, but I can't deny this connection. And right. I, yeah. so confusing. I, you know, I had, I believe I had postpartum, even though I wasn't, I guess I was sort of diagnosed with Georgia. I don't know if I had postpartum, but Georgia had a really hard time sleeping. Mm-hmm. 
And mm-hmm. so, uh, you know, we would have to walk with her and she was a chunk. She was like carrying <sighs> the couch. Right. She weighed so much. And I'm so small that I remember just being so physically exhausted from her sleep schedule for probably the first, probably the first four or five months of her life, I would have uh, your sister Annie or my mother-in-law come over and just help me. She was not a cry it out baby. I tried it. Walk, walk, walk for hours. Couldn't rock. She wouldn't rock in a rocking chair. I tried this. All the sleep method stuff had to be walking. walking. Uh That was me with Sydney. And I was like, I would cry because I was so exhausted. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that was depression or just sheer exhaustion because I don't remember being moody or despondent or I just was exhausted. Yeah. Isla, I remember thinking I would like to throw her on the bed and watch her bounce. Yeah. I would like that. Yeah. I would like to watch her entering roll postpartum. down the stairs. <laughs> that would make me feel really good. Right. <laughs> and then when I finally sought this help. This is while she's crying, screaming, um, or no. It was, uh, this was when she was a little older. Mm. She she was a dream as a baby. She would fall oh, asleep really? before I got her swaddled. Oh, how fun. Um, so I didn't have any kind of, I don't remember having any kind of depressive feelings until she got a little older, probably about, seven, eight months. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I was just angry all the time. I would wake up in the morning angry and I was angry all day and I was angry at nothing and everything all day long. Mm -hmm. So I don't think my depression looked like depression. It looked like rage. And so I wanted to- extreme irritability. It was- That's exactly what I'm talking about. It, It can hit at seven months. It, it was probably somewhere right around there because yeah. by the time she was walking, I had gone to the doctor because mm-hmm. I was like, something's, what the, finally, <laughs> when I finally sought help, I was in the girl's bedroom with them, playing with them. And Isla was doing, Isla was super active. So she was doing something that was probably not safe for her that I was trying to help her manage. Right. And it wasn't going well. And I wanted, that's the moment when I wanted to throw her on the bed and watch her bounce. Mm -hmm. So I went out of the room, closed the door, went in the bathroom, picked up the lid of the toilet and broke it on the toilet. Mm -hmm. And I went, I think I need to go see the doctor. This, because in my brain, I kept going, this is not right. This is not right. And I can't help how I feel. It was so intense. Yeah. My, uh, I, I felt like I was going like shaking. I was squeezing myself and shaking to try and get the energy out of my body because I wanted to. I never have felt that way toward Georgia. It was just Isla, and but Isla was the baby. So I don't know why. I don't remember losing my patience with Georgia. And thank you for doing that because every time I go into a rage, I'm like, well, Leanne broke a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. I honestly, I always go, well, Leanne blo- broke a toilet. I, so I guess I could do toilet? this and still be under that bar. <laughs> I set the bar. Was it the yeah, toilet did. or the toilet lid? The it was seat. the lid. Oh, I took the lid off and yeah. broke the it over the seat. toilet would have been amazing. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I took the lid off and went smash and watched it shatter. And I felt so much relief. Yeah. And I went, I need to go to the doctor. So I went to see my regular general practitioner Mm -hmm. and said, this is what's happening. She said, I think you need to be back on the pill. I think you need a slight shift in hormones. Yeah. Let's try it and see if that works. Yeah. It was so, it worked so fast. changing. Yeah. Yeah. Because that hormonal shelf just goes off and. Yep. She said, let's put you on the ring because it releases all day long, Mm -hmm. slow release all day long and see what it does for you. And it was like everything just calmed down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was so crazy because that is clearly a chemical problem. Mm -hmm. That's not, I'm not a rageful person. I don't think I've ever done anything like that since that time. I've never like broken anything or, but yeah, I remember and it comes feeling up from deep inside. Yeah. It's like almost it's primal. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's nonverbal. Yeah. It's not even the seeing the the visual I would see Isla bouncing on stuff. Right. Me not me throwing, so but her bouncing. It's right? a, it's very kind of it's reminiscent of OCD, right? There's like these when you have OCD, you have what they call intrusive thoughts. Mm. And they're thoughts that happen to mm-hmm. you without your permission. Mm-hmm. So you'd have a flash. Mm-hmm. That's right. You're like, oh God, no, 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 no. That's the thought I don't want to have. I can't have. I didn't ask for it. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people experience that with postpartum mm. depression. And, you know, when you psychosis. get into psychosis, mm-hmm. it's more visual and auditory hallucinations and stuff. But that vision of like, 
you know, for me, it was she's driving and she's got her license and she gets in a car wreck. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I'm like, I can't I can't handle this. I can't have no she's she's going to stop aging right now. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So those kind of visions are just they come in without your consent. Mm-hmm. You're not sitting there thinking of them. Mm-hmm. No, know? no, they they were like a flash. Yeah. It was like, it was exactly like that. Like a lightning bolt of a visual Mm -hmm. of the baby like being thrown and bounced. And I felt relief after I saw that, which was really scary. And then I would go, that's not good. That's really unhealthy. Like I, uh, that's scary. Yeah. Um, But then I always, I think a lot of women do this. I can figure this out. Mm -hmm. I got it. Yeah. I'll figure it out. I can handle it. I just need a nap. I just need a minute. I just need to have someone come over and take care of the baby for a day and then I'll be better. That's not true. Right. No. When you're in that kind of chemical altered state, yeah. it's not true. You need to go get something to help you, someone to help you. Maybe yeah. it is talk therapy. Maybe it is CBT. It, I, maybe I wanted it's- more of that. Like when it happened to me with Teddy, it was so scary. Um, Doing weird stuff like I wouldn't get in elevators by myself. Like it was mm-hmm. scary right. where I go, I'm losing my mind. And no one's telling me. And my therapist, I remember that's when I started the CBT. And I asked him, I was like, so do you think, um, you think this is like hormonal? You think like my hormones have crashed? Maybe like it's been seven months because I was Googling everything. I, you know, referenced my own online doctor. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he's like, it doesn't matter. And that that infuriated me. I love It infuriated me. But it doesn't matter. He was like. He's got to treat the problem. Who cares what the. He's like, it doesn't matter what's causing it. Right. It, we're treating the problem. Yeah. And I'm like, but no, if I understood, if you told me my hormones have crashed or this happens to your body after six months and that explains the timing, then I'd be able to be at peace with what's happening to me. Right. So but just, all the unknown is making me feel like I am losing my mind. Mm. That is a good point because so many people are like, you know, first of all, why is this happening to me at seven months or when is this going to end? Mm-hmm. I mean, postpartum depression resolves. Mm-hmm. It will eventually resolve mm-hmm. even if you don't treat it. Right. It's a nasty ride, but it will resolve. Postpartum psychosis, not so much. Right. Um, what happens with postpartum psychosis? Someone- something has been triggered. And you stay in some state of psychosis? Unless it's treated. Wow. Yeah. That's scary. It's, it's almost like, you know, when, when somebody goes and has- Like PTSD. Or or like a, a schizophrenic break, mm. right? Like it, you, somebody can mm. have schizophrenia and it's dormant for years, but then they go to college and it's too much for them to handle and a flip, is, a switch is flipped, mm. right? I thought that so, switch flipped in May with Teddy, where I was like, because right. we had an uncle who was schizophrenic mm-hmm. and it's genetic. And it came out in like his early twenties, and right. I was like, "It was passed along to For me." Women, like, it comes out much earlier. So you were, what my way past. He was like, "We yeah. can rule that out." Yeah. yeah. I was like, <laughs> oh, you. Thank God! Yeah. Thank God! I was like, you hear "Like you <laughs> but know." To have that on your conscience is that you know, especially if you don't talk you're, about you're going it, going through yeah. the checklist, going, "Do right. I have this?" Right. Like, no one's explaining this to me. Yeah. And I guess in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter, but it would. Be so helpful if you just, could under, to understand it. So here's mm-hmm. why it doesn't matter. Postpartum is a confluence of issues. It's being, it, it's, it's like sabotage on so many levels. Financially, you are compromised in some level, right? Mm-hmm. All the hospital bills, the doctor bills, everything you're going to be facing, that happens. Socially, it's attacking you, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to be isolated from the friends that don't have kids. You're going to be you know, flooded by in-laws you didn't want to have. You're going to be like, you know, it, it gets you on that level. Psychologically, if you've never done it before and you have no idea what you're doing, you don't feel good about yourself, you're worried, you're, you know, is every single thing, you know, you're baby proofing long before you ever need to baby proof. You don't know what, you know, mm-hmm. what's up and what's down. Um, emotionally, you know, just how you feel on a daily basis is your, your body's hijacked from the mm-hmm. day you're pregnant, right? Like, you know, I always tell the husbands when they come in, you don't, he's like, oh, my wife. I'm like, it's, you're so obviously loving and wonderful, but you don't know what she's going through. Right. And, and it's the way you can. And he's like, no, but I know I go to all the visits. I'm like, I understand. But you go to work and you forget that there's a pregnancy at home and mm-hmm. she's at home and every gurgle or gas bubble or kick or nausea, like is literally every second of the day, mm-hmm. she's constantly reminded. Mm-hmm. So not the same, although I love your effort, you know, like, <laughs> right. but I try to like educate them that they can't possibly. Yeah. It's just yeah. not possible. No. But so there's so many different areas that it attacks you from. Mm-hmm. 
it's, that is what causes it. It's not just, and oh, and plus biochemically, it's all the hormones that, you know, they triple and then they evacuate immediately and it takes time to regain them again. Mm -hmm. All of those things happening at the same time is the perfect storm. Right. You know. And it's no big shock that we're tribal people Mm -hmm. because if we all lived in a tribe, somebody else would handle the baby when you go through that stuff and everybody, it it could normalize probably faster because- Sleep deprivation is very real when Mm -hmm. you have a young baby, especially if you're breastfeeding. What am I going to wake Bert up to put a baby on my boob? Mm -hmm. No, I'm the one waking up all the time. And sleep deprivation is so very real. And I can't imagine how, why, I mean, how that affects you is, is just, it's just everywhere. It's in every part, not, not to mention your hormones, you know? But that in and of itself, I mean, if you have yeah. you watch college kids that are sleep deprived just from staying up on, you know, doing papers, not, you know, not the ones that are partying, partying, mm-hmm. um, you know, you watch them and they're like, huh? you know, like, yeah, they, and they zombie. get angry and irritable mm-hmm. and then they sleep, you know, they have to sleep double just to come back to where they were. I mean, that in you can get sleep induced psychosis. Mm. If you don't have enough sleep, you can right. actually bring yourself to psychosis that way. So you know, that is a huge part of it too. It is. Yeah. The social part. And yeah, it's all just a big mm. shit cocktail. Yep. <laughs> uh, it is. It's yeah. a big shit cocktail. Yeah. And, you know, also good. It's the holding the two feelings at the same time. Right. I feel like no one ever gives voice to the part that just absolutely sucks about yeah. being a parent in general, but especially when they're so small Ugh. with the no sleep and the mm-hmm. no want for sex. And I don't want to put on makeup. I, not that I put on makeup anyway, but I don't want to do anything. I don't yeah. want to see anybody. Everything sucks. Everything's hard. You no, know, I, I had a, I used to do baby groups, new baby groups. And I had a woman in one of my baby groups who was hysterical she her husband came with her to the six-week checkup and you know at the six-week checkup they're like oh you know you're all good you know you could probably you could start having sex or like it was like a four-week checkup you can have sex six weeks and he was like you know beaming right and she's in baby group going no way in hell there's no way in hell I'm not not doing it right so it gets to be about seven weeks Mm -hmm. and he's like so (laughs) and she's like the doctor said six months and he was like, she did? She's like, hello? Yes, she said six months. What's wrong with you? And he's like, okay. So then we're in baby group and she's at like the four and a half month mark. Oh my God. And now she wants to have sex, right? <laughs> so she goes home and she goes, hey, um, you want to? And he's like, we can't for like another two months. She goes, I was lying. <laughs> Stop it. I was like, hysterical but yeah that nobody wants to talk about all of that i mean and our group was great because it was a postpartum baby group it wasn't regular baby group right right so you were encouraged like it was like outdo each other yeah you right know, like talk Give me about all the, the shit stuff. yeah exactly well i i think about i think about the sex part a lot because i think um like now it's been what 15 years since i have my last kid but um Sorry to talk about this in front of you, Cotty, but okay. you know, oh, Bert, Bert's yeah. like Bert's like at week four going and tick tock, tick tock. Like as soon as that six week mark hits, it is over. And I was not emotionally ready because I know you both had a C section, but when you have a natural birth, everything about your vagina is completely unrecognizable. Even six weeks after, everything is still very swollen. Yeah. Everything is still very. I mean, I didn't like take a mirror and check it out, but I could tell just by right. it didn't feel you didn't it, feel like you were back to yourself. I felt like a single car garage was still a three car garage. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want anybody's business anywhere. I was embarrassed. And I even though you know why this has happened, mm, it's yeah. an obvious, you know, it, I just pushed a baby out. Right. I was really embarrassed. I was very modest about that because Because I just didn't want, I felt very imperfect. And not that I felt perfect before, but I felt damaged. I had an episiotomy. Well, I tore and then they cut me. Mm -hmm. And so I had this big stitch. I was scared that that was going to be really painful. Or open, yeah. And I was like, I just didn't want to deal with any of it because I'm sleep deprived. I'm trying to figure out how to be a mother. I have a baby that won't sleep. um, And I'm doing all this by myself. And Bert's like, hey, baby. 
six <laughs> weeks on Friday. And so, I'm like, you can take the six weeks and shove it right up your ass. I was so not yeah, into it. You're perfectly not sewn ass. And I, I, my, <laughs> you're perfectly right. not sewn. And I'd said to him, what if your oh, dick had exploded? And then they put it back together. Would you be like, let's just take it for a test drive? Yes, he would. I don't think he would. He, I, he would. said, I totally would. I'd have to. And I'm like, have I'm feeling the birth? opposite. They just exploded my shit and put it back together. Yeah. And there now you're saying you're going to put something in it. Yeah. I don't want anything in it. I don't want a tampon in it. I don't yeah. want anything in this thing. Yeah. It was so unnerving. That piece really unnerved me yeah. of my of that part of my body. I thought was going to be changed forever mm -hmm. because it takes a long time for back. it to kind of recalibrate. Yeah. And um, not that sex is all that your marriage is about, but sex, if, if sex is working great, it's like 10% of your marriage. Yeah. If sex is not working great, it's like 90. Right. Where all of a sudden it's everything. Yeah. And it became everything for Bert. So I started having to have sex to keep him regulated a completely against what I wanted. Right. Because so then the resentment starts growing. And growing. It wasn't a resentment. Maybe it was a resentment, but I, I mean, having to, I was angry Pretend to be, in I the was mood. angry yeah. that I was asked to do that right. when I had just done this thing. Well, you're like, I'm taking care of these people and now I have to service you. Exactly. And I, I didn't, felt. and I and don't I, want to be serviced at the moment. I articulated that yes. and it didn't really, my brain, yeah, I'm surprised. You know, yeah. well, you You're cannot like, have this lollipop. There My are brain. other outlets for that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but I, I can't believe he's the only man who at six eight weeks is like bada bing. No, and I can't believe I'm the only woman that at six weeks was like fucking no. no way. Yeah, and there's a big disconnect mm -hmm. with that. Even with the C-section tribe. I mean, I don't know if you. Had this, but I mean, people like your stomach deflates. Oh, it's, and then there's a flap, and, and it never goes like, back. Right, and, and then there's a flap. Yeah, there's yeah. a flap, like it just goes. It's just like what do you mean? Just, there's a flap, like that. Your, your stomach doesn't go right back in yeah. right away. Oh, well, my stomach isn't all the way back in. But either. There, it just you're there's just, just like kinda, a dead zone. There's like a dead zone, and also there's no nerves there. Yeah. So it's very, <laughs> it's just odd, and getting back that kind of. You know, I mean, especially with me, like when I opened up again, that was like, that was no fun. So no. Having to go through the infection period with that. But it, there's just this whole, like, I have been taken apart like a bizarre anatomy doll. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's supposed to happen right now. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's just, even though it wasn't vaginal. Right. There's just a whole. Still some trauma. Weird, that, right. There's a physical trauma that happened to your body, mm -hmm. regardless of how that baby came out. Uh -huh. That is like, can I just have a minute? Yeah. And by the way, I'm also taking care of a new human that I'm just trying to focus on not killing yeah. for a year. Like, I remember our first birthday party. We were like, we kept her alive for a year. All <laughs> right, we made That's, it. We seriously had that conversation. We're like, the first birthday is all about celebrating the fact that, you know. She you, made it. She made it. Yeah. It's well, crazy. It is. I found uh, being a new mother extremely traumatizing. <laughs> um, I found it also very rewarding. I, but I think that always goes without saying. What asshole <laughs> hates? I knew I'd crush this. You know, yeah, like, who, who? No I, 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 yeah. I mean, I did a good job as a mom. I was fine, but it was completely traumatizing yeah. to me personally. Just the physical part of it was awful. And I had, I don't know if you know this, but I had a date rape in college. So I had all of these unresolved things yeah. with my vagina that I think just kind of came all back yeah. when I had a baby. No, the body holds the memory. Yeah, the body totally held. I mean, I buried the incident for like six years and didn't even remember it. It mm -hmm. came back to me in a complete flash and I went, holy shit, I've got to tell somebody this right now or I'm just mm -hmm. going to bury it again. Right. So I think I had that piece that brought all this trauma right to the forefront right. that I had to deal with also. And I, I, th I am not the only woman that was date raped in college right. who then has a baby and I don't know if, I don't know in the moment that I put two and two together as to why I was so shaken up when I had a baby. Mm -hmm. um, but later, I definitely think those two things were related. Oh, yeah, because completely. Your, your, your body's going, none shall pass. Yeah, in right? both incidents, right? Like, <laughs> right, yeah. So you're like, that That trauma kind of reveals itself in a different shade. Mm -hmm. And like, you're. it doesn't matter that it's a different situation with somebody you absolutely love. It's... Hold on, I, I I'm not okay with this right now. Yeah, you I know? don't want this yeah. right now. I'm I'm broken. Yeah, yeah. Can you let me be broken for just a minute? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And he just couldn't, he just couldn't let me be broken. Yeah. He had to have that You're third lollipop. You're always beautiful to me. I know. Yes. Yeah, shut up. That's not what's <laughs> happening here. Well, of course not. I know that in my brain. Right, right. But my body's going, happening. no. My whole body was going, no, 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 mm-hmm. no, 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 for, for a lot of stuff. Not just that, but for the lack of personal time. You know, your personal, not that I had a, tons of personal time to start with. Yeah. But he did have some. <laughs> and for that to be just totally taken away. And you, both of you probably, like I were older. I was 33, almost 34 when I had Georgia. Yeah. And so you've had this whole life before. I wonder, I'd be interested to know, maybe you know the answer to this, if postpartum is more prevalent in older women. It's more prevalent in younger women. Is it really? Uh-huh. Really? Uh-huh. Why? I, I, I think... I don't know, but I remember the research on it being at the time I read it, and who knows if they've come out with new studies because I've been a member of Postpartum Support International forever. They they attribute it to a lack of knowledge and a lack of preparedness, mm. adding to the anxiety and having to figure things out and like the financial insecurity and everything. Whereas when you're older, you have, I think they probably attributed some of it to there's a desire for kids when you're older. Sometimes mm-hmm. you're like dying to have them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a pointed, you know, specific purpose that you're doing this for. And yeah. it, the funny thing about that is I had a lot of people who came to me who had infertility and they went to like in vitro or all sorts of lengths to have a baby. And then they had postpartum and they were like, I'm the worst person in the world mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I just spent $60,000 trying to have a kid and now I don't even want it. Mm. And I'm like, nope postpartum is postpartum regardless of how you got there. Right. Right. Like it's just, and it's all going to be okay. Mm. And what doesn't come out in the wash will come out in the rinse. Yeah. But just hang in there. We're going to get through this, you know, but they felt like I'm the biggest asshole on the planet that I went through all of these lengths and like people from all in my life knew exactly what was going through. And I've cried on everybody's shoulder. And now I'm like, take this baby away from me. Yeah. Right. So, you know, someone that went through that? You don't have yeah. to name them. No, no, but- no. Yeah. And she was like, I can't believe I'm about to say this. Mm-hmm. I was like, what? She's like, I cannot believe I wanted this so badly. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's I the think, hardest yeah. job ever. And then again, guilt. Again, yeah. right there. Guilt. You know, right? she fought for so many years. She's like, I cannot believe that this is what I wanted so badly. Yeah. I'm like, it doesn't take away from the fact that it's just hard. Right. Mm-hmm. It's hard. Yeah. You know? It's really hard. It's a grind. <laughs> I'm like a and 40 this- year old with a one year old. I'm like, it is a grind. And it's also the one job you can't quit. No, no, <laughs> nobody can't just, walk away. I mean, you could can't walk off the job. We've seen that happen too. But yeah, you can't walk off the job. I, I, well, I had someone walk off the job. Yeah, <laughs> I was four. She walked off the job. Yeah, that's yeah. true. And yeah. she came back, and then she walked off again at thirteen. And she's like, I'm done. Yeah. But it's amazing how naturally it came for you. Yeah. Well, I think I mean, part of it's it was my dad. Yeah, but but you know, it's nice of you to say, but, Cotty. Yeah, but to not. To, to generally generally have like someone that literally walked off the job mm. and you did it, you just slided right into that role, slid right into that role. And it, it it's so natural for you. Oh. I look at you and I look at Annie, or my sister and her sister-in-law, doesn't have kids, but I look at the two of them and I'm like, they were born for this. Like yeah. I was not, I'm not totally effing it up right. by any, you know, but like right. it doesn't come naturally for right. me. It's like a man had a baby. Right. You know, like in a weird I know what way. You mean. Yeah. You know, it's You're not like, to I have say to do there's a little bit more research. I got to yeah. do a little bit like it doesn't just flow. like I'm not like. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know. But why do you think that? Because I think you're a good mom. I think you're a good mom. I'm a fun mom. You are a fun mom. Yeah, so a fun mom. you're not the same mom. I- 